It's our unofficial Ring of Honor show, apparently. We have NFL legends. That's right. Jared Allen is here. Sean Alexander. They're both being inducted, as they should and well deserve, in the next few weeks with their respective teams. We also have Adam Lefko on the show. No Ring of Honor. He does have a, a wedding ring, so he's got one up on me. Let's go. Your girl took in her first hockey game in about 12 years last night. Don't understand the rules. I thought the power play was when someone was doing something sp fantastic and spectacular and everybody was just cheer cheering on that it was a power play, but uh, had an absolute blast. Of course, I think we're working on our TV situation. Everything's the Gremlins today, Mercury and Retrograde in the studio. Uh, but I had a great time. Thank you to the LA Kings for inviting me. They lost last minute to the Las Vegas Knights, but it was a good time, so appreciate that. And uh, now you get to deal with my voice and my underreactions, because we're all about overreacting in the NFL. There's only, you know, 17 games. There's all this going on, so everything matters a lot more. But here are some storylines that I believe that we are underreacting to, and one of them is Hassan Reddick, because I love a comeback story. I love a rewrite. So here we go, and tweet me yours at Up and Adam Show. This is the former Cardinals first rounder. Remember, he makes his return to Arizona this week, and he comes up with a big sack of Kyler Murray. He did that. He helped the Eagles to move to 5-0. But it's just part of what's making this season special, potentially, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say, Defensive Player of the Year worthy. In week four, he was the NFC Defensive Player of the Week. He had two sacks, he had two forced fumbles, and two fumble recoveries when they took down the Jags. Uh, and we do have Jared Allen coming up on the show. And, you know, he and Jared Allen are, happen to be the only players that have accomplished that feat in the last 24 seasons. He has four and a half sacks now, Hassan Reddick, in the last three games. And he is a big reason why this Eagles team might go to the Super Bowl. Uh, in Arizona, why he is leading this team defensively to being uh, undefeated, the only undefeated team in the NFL. Beyond that, there's the numbers. We all love it. We all, and it all matters. But his story is spectacular, I, and I love seeing this for him. Because of the way things played out early on in his career, there were big expectations. I remember interviewing him on the draft red carpet. He ends up being taken 13th overall to Arizona, and it was a disappointment early. It was, oh, it's on Reddick, he's a bust. Uh, and the reason was the Cardinals tried to make him an off-ball linebacker. And then he breaks out in 2020 when they get a little smarter and they moved him to edge. He had 12 and a half sacks, and then Arizona let him walk. Goes to the Panthers. One-year deal, 2021. Racks up another 11 sacks. They, for some reason, go, I don't want him either. And they don't re-sign him. So he ends up with the Eagles. Three-year deal. By the way, right across the bridge from where he grew up in Camden, New Jersey, playing in the same stadium where he played college ball at Temple. So this is one of those full circle, almost like a ring. You guys, full circle moments for our, our guy, Hassan Reddick, who we are certainly cheering on this morning. I don't know what you'd call the green I'm wearing. It's not Eagles green. It's kind of throwback Mitchell and Ness yeah. vintage Eagles green. Okay. Nick Chubb, the other thing that we are underreacting to heading into week six, which I can't believe, uh, he's so good. Why don't we give Nick Chubb the same energy that we gave Derrick Henry in 2020 and Jonathan Taylor each and every week last year, and the energy that we are giving to Saquon Barkley this season. He is not only the NFL's leading rusher, he is the first player in NFL history, and these numbers are important because it's never, anything that's never been done before in this game needs to be celebrated. First player to have 575 plus yards and seven touchdowns before is a hundredth carry of the season. And it's not just numbers, baby, it is how he is doing it. Did anybody see the stiff arm? of Khalil Mack on Sunday. I did, it was gorgeous. And he now leads the NFL with 42 missed tackles forced this season. So there was an extra, you know, the, the missed extra point for the Jets and the missed field goal this past Sunday against the Chargers. The Browns would be sitting at four and one and it would be because of Nick Chubb. And that's maybe why he's not being talked about uh, in the likes of the Giants. And we of course love the comeback story aspect for Saquon, so this isn't a knock on Saquon, but it is a, an awakening. We need to be reacting more and appreciating greatness when it comes to what Nick Chubb does. And he's old school and he kind of puts his head down and he does it the right way. And instead of, you know, he should be the storyline in Cleveland this season, nothing else. Uh, Russell Wilson is another thing we're underreacting to because there's injury news. With all the energy people were putting into their jokes on Thursday night into Friday and into the weekend, my response Friday morning was this. Maybe the shoulder is more of a factor than we think. 
I'm not a doctor, but I know he was on the injury report. I know I saw him walking to the tent last night. And I got to tell you, I don't hope for injuries, but I'm almost hoping that this is the shoulder because at least it's an excuse for Russell Wilson. Horrible O-line play horrendous quarterback play, and everyone is dragging Russell Wilson. Lo and behold, his lat is literally torn. Again, I'm no doctor, but I know he's getting surgeries on it. He's gotten zero attention from the media on this. He underwent a procedure following Thursday night's loss to the Colts. I'm not making excuses, but this is possibly, I don't know why he hesitated and why I hesitated to be super critical of him on Friday. The signs were all there, and they are there. He's completing under 60% of his passes for the very first time in his career. You can sort of see that something's not right physically there, and all indications are that he will be out there Monday night against the Chargers. They do have extra rest, right? They played last Thursday. Now it's a Monday night game, and that might help his recovery. You might see something else. But either way, it's, it's a good something to learn from and move on from. The next time you want to clown on a player or you see something uncharacteristically terrible, remember there might be a reason and there, I feel like such a preaching mom right now, but I'm so mad because everyone was so mean to him and I don't care if you don't like him and I don't care what you think about him, but like to come after his play without knowing any sort of full story when you know it doesn't look like what he's looked like for his whole career was weird. Okay, give me your takeaways and underreactions at Up and Adam Show and to talk week five. And this is why I'm acting like this because I cannot believe we have this, this guest right now. I cannot believe this guy is on the show. I've been going hard. Nice sack by Jared Allen. Oh, it's a sack by Jared Allen. Tell me what you know about. <laughs> this is incredible. If you have any questions for this guest, please hit us up on Twitter. One of the absolute, unquestionably, undeniably best pass rushers of all time, a four-time All-Pro, five-time Pro Bowler, 136 career sacks, a Vikings legend, an NFL legend, Jared Allen. Hi. Hey, how are you? I'm so, so good. Show me, where are you? Show me, show me your life. This is incredible. Oh, just at my screen porch right now. Enjoying some beautiful, it's going to be like 80 today in here in Nashville. So just oh. getting some good fresh Jared, you, fresh got, a little, air, you, you know? got a little something back. What, what's going on back oh, there? Oh yeah, the flow, the flow is nice, you know? So just, just keeping it rocking, keeping it rocking. Uh, we haven't seen you in a while. I know you're doing a lot philanthropically. I know you're doing a lot in Nashville. We follow you, of course, on social media. But you announced your retirement, uh, which everyone in the NFL loved, riding a horse. Uh, so have you, in fact, become a full-out cowboy? Oh, yeah, I grew up on a horse ranch. My dad trained raining, cutting horses, so that was kind of my life. And now uh, we got a we got a little farmhouse about, you know, hour north of where we live. And actually my old man lives up there, takes care of our horses and stuff like that. So, uh yeah, I get up there, I get to do some roping, hang out, and all that fun stuff. It's amazing. So, uh, also, congratulations on what's going on in Minnesota, uh, as you will soon be immortalized there, which has to be incredible to even think about. It's the Vikings Ring of Honor. You're happening. Uh, it's week eight, I believe, against the Cardinals. What does that mean to you? Yeah, it's just it's incredibly humbling. I feel like I just regurgitate the same thing over and over when people ask me that yeah. question. We not much more to say than. Uh, that it's just kind of surreal. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of that same way when, when I made the Hall of Fame finals for the first two times, you know, it's just, it's that disbelief that, you know, something I did so long ago has, you know, held its weight and, and carried through. So, um, you know, Minnesota was, was the world to me, uh, you know, coming out of Kansas City and them to put all that trust and faith into me. So it was just, you know, I have so many great friends and then up, it just up in the whole organization, not just people I played with. So it was great. They, they, they actually tricked me nicely. I thought I was out there just for some uh, charity event. Nice. And, you know, speak to Dave. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be, uh, it's one of those things where I guess I don't know the reaction I'll have until I have it. I'll probably cry because I'm a big baby at heart. Um, you know, so uh, we'll see. But uh, it, it, it's good. Plus, I get to go in right after, you know, Kevin Williams. Um, it's about the only thing I guess he beat me in when we played together. Was he got to go to the ring of honor for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, Kevin's one of my best friends, and uh, I love that guy. So to be able to go in right after him is, is a huge, huge deal. That's amazing. Do you keep in touch with those guys? You know, I, I don't want to ask you questions you get asked all the time, but when, when you, when you, you have to get a little nostalgic as this is coming up in a couple of weeks. Yeah, you know, I, I tend to try to just live in the moment, so I don't, I don't, you know, typically run down like you know the glory days, you know, rabbit holes. But um, 
But yeah, I think you go back and and you, and you look at. I think more so, you you know, being able to talk with the guys you play. But yeah, I keep in touch with Kevin. Uh, he's one of my those guys where maybe we talk every few weeks or every once a month or something. It's like no time passes, right? You know, he's busy with his kids. I'm busy with my kids and family, and so you know, you get to keep in touch with Big Pat. Although little Pat Pat's Pat's down, I think he's lost like a hundred pounds. Oh my so, gosh! Uh, yeah, just just different guys like that. B Rob and, and you know you know Ben Lieber stuff like guys throughout the league that I played with. Uh, you know, keep tabs on every now and then, and so it'll be good to to see everybody. You know, back in in one space there, whoever can make it. So you know, then I'm sure we'll we'll go down the glory day pathway a little, little bit with your highlight videos. But um, none of your old but, yeah, NFL just, friends, none of your old NFL friends come come over to Nashville and ride horses with you. No, not yet. I got to get, you know, Castle and I, our kids go to school together, so I should probably get him up on the, uh, on a horse and see if, you know, test his chops a little bit. I know he uh, he says he rides a little bit, but we'll put a rope in his hand and see if he can handle it. I need, I need a GoPro situation with that. He was just on the show not long ago. That's app, That would be amazing. You guys could do a podcast uh, we'll make, like we'll that. Make it, we'll do, make it happen do for well. sure. Uh, you mentioned the Hall of Fame, so I have to go for it. What is your relationship with the Hall of Fame right now, the idea of it? Um, sad. <laughs> I mean, it, no, it's one of the, again, it's one of those things where it's, I, I try not to put a whole lot of stock in it. It's not from the Hall of Fame standpoint. Obviously, being inducted in the Hall of Fame would be one of the greatest honors of my life. Um, but there's nothing I can do about it. It's one of those things that's like, you're trying to get into somewhere, but there's nothing you can do to help yourself or, you know, so, um, you know, hopefully my, my career, uh, my effort, my, my love for the game stands for itself and, and they want to put me in. Um, it's not nothing I can do, but I, I always joke. I'm like, it's, it's great of honor to be. My life's not going to change, mm. you know. Uh, my wife's not going to love me more or any less. My kids aren't going to love me more or less. Still got to pick up dog crap in the backyard. Um, the lawn's got to get mowed. You know what I mean? It'll I, be, I, it'll I do be and phenomenal, I don't. but... It's good perspective. Yeah. How do you have that? Where do you get that discipline from? Because if I had your numbers and your impact and knew that I belonged in the Hall of Fame, I would be trying every which way. Why didn't I get in? Who didn't vote me in? Like that's, I would approach it in a, in a much different way. Why don't you approach it that way? And, and you know, where do you get that centering from? It's really impressive. Uh, I've tried, you know, through, through faith, obviously through my, 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 my family, right? I mm. mean, I'm, we're, you know, we're hard. I mean, I grew up blue collar as all can be, you know what I mean? It's just so you put your work in and there's nothing. I've always just had this mindset that, you know, I'm not going to worry about things I have no control over. And I got no control over what happens. Um, would I, was I disappointed I didn't get in last year? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I don't under, you know, for me, and I, and I told our voters this, I'm like, you know, you made me a first ballot finalist in one of the arguably the greatest classes ever just to hold me over now three years. I don't understand the process. I don't think anybody understands the process, but that's not really for me to understand, I guess. So, uh, and if it's, and if it's a popularity deal and I got to like, you know, go out there and be texting people for votes. Politicking. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not into that. So, no, I don't want you like to I say said. that. I don't want you to say that because if that's true and they're hearing this, it's not good. No, like you got put on the smile, <laughs> shake some hands, kiss no, some babies. No, I, I, I'm just, I'm authentically I'll do your PR. So I, I appreciate it. Um, no, I, I, I'm authentically me. And so I, when I talk to the, the Hall of Fame, you know, when I talk to the voters, I talk to people at the Hall of Fame. I have great conversations with them. I have no ill, Ill feelings. Like I said, it's, uh, Again, the process can be a little grueling sometimes when you think you might have a chance to get yeah. in and then you, you know, get the call that you're not in. It's a little um, it's a little uh, disappointing, but you move on, you get over it, and it is what it is. So uh, that's kind of just, just kind of way I, I try not to worry about things I don't have control over. And uh, when and if it happens, it'll be one of the most amazing days. Um, if it never does, well, I guess that's uh, that's God's plan. I'm gonna handle your your PR. I think it wasn't it. Who was it? Isaac Bruce. That when he finally got in, he didn't answer the door for the first like f like seven knocks because <laughs> he was so annoyed, and it was uh, you know him being pe you know petty about it, which is incredible. But we're gonna handle this a different way, Jared Allen, because my, you, my friend, belong in the Hall of Fame, and everyone watching, and every every what, one yeah. of those voters know it. My PR people are mad that I don't do more interviews talking about how badly I want to be in the in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Hall of Fame. They want me to politic more. It's yeah. just not in my I mean, it's hearing, just not in my being. <laughs> hearing you say you're sad though, and hearing you say that you'll cry to be in the Ring of Honor, that's that's good stuff. That that will work. Oh yeah, that'll I'm get you that. Like, <laughs> I'm emotional when it comes to like that stuff. My wife threw out a retirement party for me. And it was a surprise party, and you know, on my birthday, my kids ran up and hugged me, and all of a sudden, I was just bawling, like in front of all my friends and family. And she was like, "I didn't expect that to come out of you." I'm like, "Me neither." So um, I'm, I'm, I get a little sentimental, but I, I played I played the game of football since I was eight, right? Uh. It was it was literally never about anything but just like genuinely loved the game of football. Um, 
it, there's no greater feeling to explain to somebody when you just snap the neck of a quarterback <laughs> and 80,000 people scream like it just there's nothing greater. So it was never about <clears throat> excuse me, it was never about the money. It was never about anything just other than I just, you know, I knew I knew hardworking fans, the Americans that came out and watched us play. Mm. I remember getting a note in Kansas City. This guy wrote me a note in Kansas City that he spent like four hundred dollars a week on his um season tickets and he only made like three hundred and fifty dollars a week right uh which bad financial advice so don't don't do what that guy was doing but it just showed me like there's people spending every last cent to get that enjoyment for one day so if i can provide that i shouldn't take that for granted i played a game for a living so that's, that's why i played so the rest of it yeah it is what it is um the accolades are great uh, yeah i mean I'll, I'll be lying if i said i wasn't chasing down everybody in front of me i did i wanted to be you know, I wanted 200, I wanted 150, yeah. um, ended at 136. So, uh, but yeah, that, that's why. So I guess that's kind of why I got the mindset. Well, it is what it is. I know I, there's no regrets. You know, I know I, I know I gave it everything. I'll, I'll tell you, that is a hell of a Hall of Fame mentality that you have about what it meant. You did it for you, you did it for fans, and that's going to take you uh, a long way. And you, I, there's nothing like the juxtaposition of you saying that you're a softy <laughs> crying. And while you're telling me the story about your retirement party, Jared, I'm thinking about like all the quarterbacks who you killed <laughs> over the years, and then watching this and be like, shut up, Jared, because you're a machine. But uh, and now you're like, oh, God, it's so funny what happens to NFL players when they retire. It's so funny. Um, being, a, being a girl dad takes it all away from you. Oh, I love that. I love that you are a girl dad. You're a perfect girl dad. That's incredible. Uh, but I do want to ask you, since you're talking about, I believe the word you used was snapping uh, quarterbacks next. Let's just get into the roughing the passer situation. Oh, because my goodness. it's brutal. I know you're watching. And, and your Vikings are sitting pretty at 4-1. and one, But let's get to some of this. Uh, you know, some of these calls, the, you know, at number 95, Chris Jones. <laughs> I just, he, all the I worst. tweeted, Jared, was he took the ball. Like, he took the but where did you want him to go? And then, of course, yeah. the Brady call from last weekend with uh, Grady Jarrett. What are you seeing in these calls? Um, you know, I, I'm not going to repeat the words that Troy Aikman said, because obviously I guess not he got good. roasted on social media. Yeah. I was just saying, I told the producer, I said, if I had any control over my own personal social media, I probably would have been all over this, just being like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. But it is. I mean, it is, it's the wussification of the NFL. I mean, that is garbage. I remember when I, I, I hit, I think, Matt Schaub or something, I don't know, in the knee, um, I got told by the NFL I had to learn how to fall differently. And now they want these people to learn how to tackle differently. So now you can't you can't fling people to the ground. You can't land on top of them. You can't pile drive them in the ground. You can't touch their head. You can't touch their knees. I mean, come on. It, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, as much money as these guys are making at the quarterback position, they assume the same risk. They should be willing to get hit just as hard as the rest of us. Um, so I think it's garbage. Uh, I think the league needs to address it because it, it's it's an unfair advantage uh, to the offense. I mean, that that was garbage. And not to mention, I mean, by rule, he took the ball. So the ball was actually out of his hand before he even tackled him. So he actually became the runner at that point. So, you know, he wasn't actually making the tackles. How was that even past, you know, pass interference or, I mean, uh, roughing the passer? It needs to worst, be. Worst calls I've ever seen in my life. I, and, I, and I think the ones where your hand accidentally touches the helmet is just absolutely terrible. Um, so, I mean, it's just getting bad. Uh how okay so don't can we do can you help me because you're great with your words you're saying all sorts of great stuff here uh <laughs> i think it needs to be defined everything you know like what's a catch that was a whole trendy thing a couple years ago and if you look at roughing the passer now and, and you know because you have to th these things are happening because player safety does need to be at the forefront i know that you agree with me there what should be considered well, yes roughing and no the yes and no okay. so here's my thing oh. on player safety, well snapping right? quarterbacks next is definitely an opinion well, well I, I i agree with player safety but player safety has to be across the board right I mean, you have some blocks that are allowed on, on some defensive players that are just absolutely terrible. But the reality is, you know, you, you go back to the Tua situation and everything like that, too. You know, everybody wants to blame the people around that, oh, you shouldn't. But he probably was asked, he wanted to go back into play. We all sign on that dotted line. We all know the inherent risk that come with playing football. Mm -hmm. So at some point, player safety is on us as well. Yes, there doesn't need to be people getting a headshot, you know, flying 100 miles an hour and targeting people's heads or taking out people's knees and certain things like that. There, there, there is a room for that. But at the same time, there is assumed risk in the NFL. And when you start trying to manage that assumed risk, you, it, you, this is the product you get. You get these little ticky tack baby fouls that that was a tackle. Like just if, if you're a quarterback and your arm and you come across and you hit your hand on someone's helmet and throw your break finger, that's, that's assumed risk you take, right? Mm. Same way if I blow an AC joint out tackling somebody, I land on my shoulder wrong, it's the assumed risk I take. 
So I, I think I think they're taking it too far, but and they're and they're using player safety to try to progress offense, make it high scoring, make it more viewer friendly, uh, and that's the problem I have with it. So they hide behind this rule of player safety, where there's no in those two, per, you know, roughing the passer, there, there's no one getting hurt. In those. That that's and if they do, then it is what it is. Define what roughing the passer should be. Well, it used to be, you know, you had about one and a half steps after the ball was released to deliver a blow, right? So I, I think forcible blows to the head um, are that would be roughing the passer. Um, I think anything great, egregiously late, right? You know, after that one mm-hmm. step is roughing the passer um, because you got to remember hitting the quarterback is a tactical part of the defense, right? Mm-hmm. If I can hit a quarterback, if I can be around, if I can be in his face time and time again, I make him start focusing on the rush. So you take every advantage that you can. Um, and to be honest, you know, being able to get your hands up, getting your hands now, now guy, you don't want to bat balls down because you might hit him in the face. You know, we used to throw our helmets across and try to get his hand to come down on it. Cause if I could break the quarterback's hand, guess what? I have a tactical advantage. Oh um, so, I mean, again, those are the assumed risks we all, we all play with. Just like I know if, if a wide receiver or tight ends in a sl- short motion from the outside, I'm probably getting ear hold in my pass. Right. I, I, I expect that. It just doesn't make it right, but it is what it is. So I, I think that's they need to go back to kind of some of the archaic rules, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And 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 players we had an understanding. We kind of knew what our player safety was, right? If someone they no one, it was kind of like baseball too. I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, I was playing with Kansas City and Trent Green went to slide and he got lit up by somebody. I mean, he was out cold, snot bubbles coming up. It was I mean, and then the only reaction was, all right, well, Carson Baldwin's head better be on a swivel, right? Because now we have to react. Oh, so Jared. I think Player safety used to be in this in this in this model though where it was it was self policed, and you didn't have a whole lot of egregious hits. And you look back at the Warren Sapp hit on um, oh wow uh, oh I forget the uh, the lineman name for Green Bay real quick. I have no idea. But I ahead. think but I think you look back in the league as players openly condemned that. You know what I mean? It was just kind of like hey that that was too far. That's too much. And and guys take it upon themselves to look out for each other for for certain things. So when you have the league doing it all the time. It just introduces these, this, this, you know, downgrade of quality of the game. In my personal opinion, I know that's a lot, and I probably sound like a complete no. It's your it's, about it, but it's it's kind of the truth. You know, when you take it out of the players' hands and you start putting it in the hands of the officials all the time, the rules get so so twisted. You don't even know how to play. Yeah, we did. I mean, we had a uh, Super Bowl winning head coach who's been on the bad end of some egregious calls. Uh, Sean Payton on with me yesterday. He was here the whole hour, and his his thing was that they put so much on the officials. Player safety shouldn't be in the hands of the officials. It's it's too much, especially you know with them not being full time officials as well. It's just a lot to lump on their plate. So in that world, less policing uh, is an interesting idea. I think there's probably somewhere in between. There's an overcorrection that's happening now, as happens with all things when you know bad things happen, a la Tua. Cause we don't want to see those things. Fans don't want to see those things. It's, you know, there's an implied risk for sure, but there, I think there has to be some middle ground. And I got to tell you, your social media person is going to be dealing, dealing with some stuff to, today because you just, <laughs> do you not have a podcast? Like, can you please do a, like, what, no, what yeah, is it going to take? Should. Or you, I mean, uh, I'll produ- I'll do your PR. I'll do your producing. We, we have a PR issue today, I think, with the head on the swivel job stuff. But we'll uh, we'll deal with that quickly. Let's talk about something happy before I let you go. And thank you for taking so much time with us this morning. It's it's honestly it's it's such an honor. And I you know I'm, I grew up a Bears fan, so you terrorized my my team for my <laughs> my entire childhood, which is great. Uh, as does every pass rusher in defense. It's fine. Uh, but in that same game where we saw that 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 awful roughing. Uh, on Chris Jones. We also saw Travis Kelsey on offense score four touchdowns, which is a very nice thing to see. And, you know, it got me thinking that, gosh, were any of those better than this grab? <laughs> oh, my first one was probably insane. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to me about this. Look at you. Yeah, you're a tight we, uh, end. we worked on that all uh, all week in practice. And uh, Coach <laughs> Saxon, our running backs coach, and our goal line, you know, kind of tight end coach, he was uh, – his whole thing was you have you got to be patient, got to be patient, right? Don't go too soon, don't go too soon, and I probably went a little too soon. Um, and then the biggest thing was I didn't know what celebration to do, so I stole everybody's. That was the you know Jason Dunn, Tony Gonzalez, or uh, Jason Dunn, um, Larry Johnson, the jump up. You had I think moves. I did the dunk. I think I did the dunk from Tony. Uh, yeah, I stole everybody's celebration. 
Uh, but yeah, it was it was a good day. I probably should have held that block a hair longer or sold it a hair longer, but I figured why not make it exciting with a little sliding over the shoulder catch. I don't know. For someone who doesn't want to see high scoring stuff in the NFL these days, you seem to like offense just a little bit. You lit up there. Oh, if it's on me, if, it, if, it's on, if, I'm, if I'm scoring touchdowns, I'm all for it. <laughs> You're amazing. Congrats on the success. Hopefully we're having this conversation down the line with Hall of Fame talk, but the Ring of Honor is a huge accomplishment. Enjoy it. And don't cut your hair. Please don't, don't like clean it up. Oh, right? yeah, never, no? never. Oh, never. Never. Of this course. is where it goes. <laughs> All right. Girl dad, Jared Allen, we appreciate you. Oh, we didn't get to say bye. We have to go because we have Sean Alexander also on the show. Wow. Here he is. Yes. We got, hey, we got to talk about you and Tiki Barber. That's coming up next. We are legendary. Alexander breaks the tackle off to the race. Wow. We are legendary. Goodbye, Sean Alexander. Touchdown. We're legendary. Legendary is right. Here he is, a running back from the Seattle Seahawks. Not just any running backs, and they've had some good ones. The 2005 NFL MVP, Sean Alexander, is here. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing, Kay? I'm so good. You were at my old stomping grounds, I believe, this morning on Good Morning Football over on NFL Network. So we're happy you took the time because there was lots to celebrate with you. This I'm kind of we're kind of vibing. I see this color situation. We, we're doing our thing here, uh, and I it's all in celebration of you. Did I pick this up off my floor and it's wrinkled? No, I did this specifically because you are entering the Seahawks Ring of Honor this weekend, which is so exciting. And congratulations, uh, Seahawks take on the Cardinals uh, for Week Six. How hyped are you for that moment? Yeah, it's super exciting. I mean, um, to play the game that you love and uh, to uh, do some some cool things, score a bunch of touchdowns, and then be uh, placed in the Raptors with some of the greats. You know, it's you know Steve Largent, Cortez Kennedy, and, uh, mm. and so to, you know, go being named with those guys uh, forever is pretty sweet. I love it. Now you uh, you were you were from a world of running backs that used to run the show. Back when yeah. the NFL was a better NFL, right? You're one of three sure. to win MVP since 2000. One of three. We haven't seen one in a decade now. And it's, it's become a quarterback award, a quarterback-driven league, all of that. Do you think we'll ever see a running back win MVP again? Yeah, I think it's going to take something that's, um, you know, over the top. A bunch of touchdowns have to be a part of it. A, a couple of games where, you know, the the, the stats are so gaudy that it, um, it grabs everybody's attention. Um, you know, not just yards, but it's going to be yards and touchdowns both. That'll be the only way I see it happening because LaDainey and I both had to do it that way. Um, and then you got to go back to Emmett. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's, they were all just crazy, like 20-some-odd touchdowns. Um, you know, in the high 20s to, to even give yourself a shot to, to have it. 2005, just, just so everyone's clear on your numbers, you put up almost 1,900 rushing yards, the second most rushing touchdowns in a single season at that point with 27. Mm -mm. And that's why you're going into that ring of honor. Uh, are there any running backs in today's game that sort of remind you of you from your playing days? Ooh, you know, uh, I, I just think that overall the performance of, of Nick Chubb is is done correctly. You know, he stays at Gavin yeah. Cook, running in in, the, in between the tackles, scoring uh, scoring touchdowns, uh, control. You know, you can always put the offense around them, and then everything kind of spins off of that. And so, uh, yeah, those, those two guys uh, they they play the way I like it. Yet somehow Nick Chubb doesn't get the love. I was talk I literally started my show with Nick Chubb because I said, why are we talking about Jonathan Taylor all this year? We're talking about Saquon this year. They all deserve it. Derrick Henry back in 2020. Nick Chubb is out there doing things we've never seen before to start five weeks of the season, and he doesn't get enough love. I love that you compare yourself uh, to him. Um, Seattle having a surprising season. Uh, do you want to yeah. talk Russell Wilson or do you want to talk Seattle? You pick. Oh, man, Gino is doing yes. so well. <laughs> I'm just I'm proud of him, Say man. He, he has fought this good fight, you know, being a backup, you know, first being a starter, then getting traded or being positioned and then being a backup with some great quarterbacks and, and finally getting his chance again and seizing a moment. You got to you got to give love to a person that that takes advantage of a new opportunity. And and, you know, uh, he's he's done a great job. He's he's performing well. He's playing well. He's got Seahawks people uh, believing that actually we can actually win and, and be competitive and, and actually upset people. Um, just proud of him and, and proud of, you know, Pete Carroll and John. They, they've done it again. They 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 go out there and they defy odds all the time. You remember that's what was Russell. Everyone's like, why are you playing this rookie quarterback when you got the best 
quarterback out of Green Bay, you know, to come, you know, and, yeah. and well, they go with their gut and uh, and the quarterbacks perform. And so, you know, so I'm proud of Gino, proud of Seahawks, excited to come back and watch them do what they do. Yeah, Gino, uh, I just like when players get to rewrite their story. It doesn't happen very often, so it should be celebrated when it is. Uh, a little birdie just told me, not a Seahawks birdie, but a birdie of a different kind, that the 20-year anniversary of your NFL record, Sean, for most touchdowns in a single half with five, you, I mean, everybody who, who faced you in fantasy football or had you on their team knows exactly what I'm talking about. Four rushing, one receiving, 30 Total points. Insane. <laughs> Walk me through what's going on in your head as you just kept on scoring touchdowns. Three scores in a minute, five seconds to end in the first half. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> you know, um, the, the, the long screen was, was uh, the, I believe, the third touchdown. And, um, and you know, I come to the sideline and they're like, man, that was, that was amazing, blah, blah, blah. And they fumbled the kickoff. And uh, I remember getting the huddle. I said, y'all, like, step on it. Like, we got to score another one before the half. And uh, threw a pass to D-Jack, and he, he gets tackled, like, on the four. And I look at him, I said, you didn't want that touchdown. I'll take it. And then, you know, and then, you, then we score. And then they fumble the next kickoff. And uh, I said, oh, my goodness, I've got to score the first play. And then, yeah. there it is right there. There's the fifth touchdown. And, um, there it is. And, it was just it was amazing it was it was fun to, to watch it happen you know that was um that was the second game in that stadium and it was against one of my good um buddies that you know there wasn't cell phones back then but randy moss was was um you know star ah. but him and charles woodson we were the three guys in yeah. high school 16 17 18 years old going to games there was no hey i'll call take me on yourself that wasn't happening back then. You would just see each other at the game, like, oh, what's up, bro? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. And so, of course, Randy goes, you know, goes to Marshall and then gets into the pros. So that was like my first time really going against my high school buddy. And I'm I'm trying to eat up. They're like, oh, this guy's the best offensive. He is? Oh, okay. Let's get this thing going. Here. So I had, I had all this extra high school motivation. Um, and so I, I was fired up for that game. And uh, and I wanted to make a statement. And so it, was, it, it went well. You know? Yeah, <laughs> went I, I'd say when we were celebrating the 20th anniversary, everybody is, of a, of a single performance in a game. That's pretty special. I'd say I'd say it went pretty well for you. And speaking yeah. of running back performances and moments, the this Tiki Barber clip with him and Chris Long lives rent free in my head. Let's take a look at this. I think we have it. And by the way, that one rushing title that I had a chance to win, Sean Alexander stole it from Did me. He's stealing from you. Yeah, because I, I ran for 200 something yards in my last game of the 2005 season. It was against the Raiders. Yeah. He wasn't supposed to play because he was in Maryland and he was at home. He was on the East Coast doing something. He yeah. came back, wasn't going to play in the game, saw that I ran for 200 yards and played the game and then and, and beat me by I don't know, 20 yards or something like that. Have so you my ever brother, to my him brother. Since? Yeah, of course. He's my brother from another mother, man. You know <laughs> Oh, Sean, you got that, that so you got real. that dog in you. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's so real. Is it though? Because okay, hold on. Let me get your let me let me set the stakes for everybody here. This is 2005. The Seahawks were 13 and I did my research on this. 13 and two. Uh, so the one seed wrapped up, nothing to play for. What is going through your head on your side of things, sitting there? It's New Year's Eve, watching <laughs> Tiki Barber go off. You know what's even crazier is, is I was in Cincinnati, um, an, 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 an older aunt had passed, and I was just with the family, and uh, I said I was on the flyback uh, to be with the team for the game, but um, but we and everything was wrapped up, and I'm on the plane, I'm at the airport, and Tiki breaks this long run, and I'm like, oh well, man, he's he's gonna get pretty close, you know what I mean? And by the time I land. He is already he's already taken the lead. And I get, I get to the hotel room and they're like, Sean, man, you know, how was the family? I'm suiting up. You know? <laughs> We're going to go get this thing, you know, and then everybody forgets like the year before I was leading the whole way through. And um, Curtis Martin uh, team goes in overtime and he beats me <gasps> the year by one yard. And so I was like, I'm not going to lose the rushing yard back to back years. Um off of somebody having a great game in the last game of the season. And so can't do it. Earth Martin did it in 04, and Tiki does it in 05, and I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm But is play. it your decision? <laughs> okay, here's one thing. I, I I worked with Nate Burleson for six years, and I know Holmgren is, is yeah. tough. Did you have to call him to ask permission to play? Like, what was that conversation? No, the big show runs everything. 
but I was one of his most be trusted people you know okay. what I mean and so he would he would allow me to voice my opinion and sometimes he would he would be upset that I'd, that I'd voice it before he was ready for everybody to know what I was thinking <laughs> and so so we but he he gave me um he gave me a lot of lean to to be me and uh to say what I wanted to say and do what I wanted to do and so you know I mean you think about it he was, so he, he was the office coordinator for Joe Montana uh Steve Young yeah. Brett Favre and then we get to Seattle and you know we shifted to to run the ball a lot more um so he allowed me to to be me and then uh and part of that was being able to have a voice it was it was pretty cool poor Tiki <laughs> yeah. hey, if it wasn't for Curtis you. Martin, yeah. Tiki might have won. You know? I agree. It's, Curtis, it's literally Curtis Martin's fault, and I Curtis didn't know that. Martin's and that fault. added a Curtis. He, Curtis is catching a stray on Twitter later that he's not even going to know what's coming. <laughs> uh, one last one for you. You were you were such an amazing running back at Alabama, and this is important because this is bef all happening before Alabama was the hot popular school, right? So many running backs now in the league. Of, you know, uh, but everyone wants to know. You know or I want to know, everyone in our control wants to know, who holds the title as the best running back for Alabama? So, <laughs> um, because I am the eldest mm -hmm. uh, of the guys, you know, I get to hold the title because it's always me and Derek, or Derek's one in the right. rushing. And I think uh, Mark Ingram is like the, or Trent, one of those two guys passed me the title. So all those guys all try to catch up with me. So I'm like one and two with, everybody and everybody else is lower in something so i i hold no threes in anything so uh <laughs> so, so, so they all get to catch up with uncle sean you know yeah. what I mean? so it's great and you hold no twos in that 2005 rushing uh, record situation either <laughs> that's for sure sean alexander congratulations this weekend i hope you guys get the win i hope you enjoy your time there and i hope you feel nothing but love from that fan base yeah, it's going to be my first time me bringing all 11 of my kids and my wife to Seattle. It's going to be awesome. Oh, a it's whole offense awesome. coming over there. Alexander's <laughs> we 11. We don't want to play. <laughs> we don't sounds play. like a movie. We can get George Clooney working on Alexander's 11 coming up. We appreciate you. Have so much fun. Take pictures and post them, okay? I will. I will. I don't know why we keep just getting rid of people. People just drop into like a, we hit a button and they fall from the universe. Uh, what a show. Hit us up at Up and Adam Show. Adam Lefko has to follow Jared Allen and Sean Alexander. Hey, did you hear Jared Allen? What, what's going on? Oh, Jalen Hurts. Let's go. When you have a Hall of Fame hopeful, Jared Allen, with 136 sacks, and Sean Alexander, who's breaking records, and he'll be honored in the Ring of Honor at the Seahawks game this week, it's only natural that you bring in Adam Lefko, our next guest, who I love, host of NBA on TNT on Tuesday, uh, one of my favorite literal voices in all of sports. How are you, my friend? Why, thank you, Kay. That was so complimentary. I want to say really quick that I like your, your vinyl in the back. I had to bring this out quickly. Yeah, we got it. We got We're it. Matching. We got the Stevie Wonder, baby. We, we, we always did. We always did. Uh, listen, you're, So what do you want to talk about, Kay? Well, let's get right to it. And we'll talk a little NBA here if we have we have some time to. But what do you, can you contain yourself? And, you know, are you nervous? Because tell me how you feel as a Philly fan right now. I woke up this morning and I went, I'm going to have to go on up and Adams and I'm going to have to say, you know, if we lose this game five and one at the bye, all those five wins, it means nothing because they <laughs> lost. Then I did some research and I feel so confident. Got a few reasons for oh you. Okay. Number one, I think this Dallas defense is great, but they have faced some of the worst offensive lines in the NFL you so tell far. Them. Cincinnati stinks. The Rams' offensive line stinks. The Giants' offensive line can't pass protect. And Washington's offensive line is awful. And now they're up against the Eagles. That's number one. Number two, I don't think Cooper Rush has played a true road game yet, Kay. He was in New York. That thing was like 60% <laughs> Cowboys fans. You're in L.A. You know who shows up to Rams games. Nobody. This is Sunday night football in the link. It's going to be a snake pit. And number three, go to your FanDuel nerds. <laughs> pre bye week teams, teams going into a bye week against a divisional team are like 70% to cover. This is a leave it all out there. I think Cooper Rush throws his first INT of the game. I think it's close. I think the Eagles pull away and make it a laugher at the end. Oh my God, I'm pumped. The A G L E S. What's good? Oh my God, you're so nuts. I love you. I miss you. Uh, okay, but, but I feel. Don't you feel like you should be a little cautious? You had a hard-fought yes. win in Arizona. Is there something the Eagles need to improve on or can improve on? My biggest fear, Hurts is 0-2 
against the Cowboys. Lost both games okay. by 20. And I went back and looked. In those games combined, Nick Sirianni had Jalen Hurts throw the ball 78 times. They ran it, not including Hurts runs, 20 times. That is not how this team plays. Sometimes Nick gets a little pass happy. You beat this Dallas Cowboys pass rush by pounding the rock. Fear number one is they throw too much. Fear number two, everyone's talking about how the Eagles are 5-0 and at halftime, like in that first half. Cowboys under Cooper Rush are 4-0. Yeah. If the Cowboys get that lead, that's the other thing that scares me. But this is a pound the rock game for the birds. Pound the rock game for the birds. All right, you were one of the OG supporters of Jalen Hurts. I don't know, is that a special t-shirt? Should we give it a shout out or? It's just, you know, Bleacher Report. Okay. It was, look, Love I that. was, when he played that game against the Saints, Kay, I'll just be honest, I bought a $4,000 sports card. I was so hopped up. <laughs> and let's just say it's gone up a lot, but I was on that bandwagon early. I'm you a huge were. fan and of And I want to get into some of this because you deserve credit, I think, because there weren't very many uh, fervent supporters of him early on, and you were, you were certainly one of those. So, you know, uh, I'm looking. Well, don't we have a tweet of this? Let's take a look. I mean, he had some serious doubters, and this is this is you, and this is. What was by the, the way, date on that too? The date that on was that, like. I got you, buddy. Come on now, December twelfth, twenty twenty. All right, so this is <gasps> a long time ago. Flash forward to now, most rushing touchdowns by a quarterback ever through their first twenty-five starts. What do you? I'm just going to give it, give you. The, what do you want to say to previous Hurts non-believers? I I think I, I interviewed Jason Kelsey at an event. And I was talking to him backstage and he said, Lefko, he's the greatest leader of men at that mm -hmm. age I've ever experienced. He talked about in the off season, he would be doing like 600 pounds on the squat and he'd look over and Hertz is, hey, can I jump in and do the same thing? You heard the way Zach Ertz talked about him. I still think that there's ways to go with his balls across the middle. I still, th he throws a beautiful deep ball. His decision-making still slow. He's, you know, year two of starting. But it's who he is in the locker room. And I think we see what's been going on with Carson Wentz. And I think when you have a true leader at that position that holds everybody accountable, mm -hmm. it is a different football team. And that's who this guy is. They're, they're a great football team. He's the perfect leader for it. I don't mm -hmm. think he's a top quarterback yet. But he's a top guy at the position in terms of factoring in the team. If he keeps throwing like this, they're going to go to the Super Bowl. And it's, you know, having that O-line and D-line does not hurt. Now, you, my friend, oh, calm down. You, from the Broad, you Broad Street Parade. I mean, it could happen. You're the voice of Bleacher Report's animated series, Gridiron Heights. We only have like two minutes to do this, and we got to bounce. So let's quickly take a look at what that is, because we love it. Mm. Bring me back to when football was football and men were men, men. God bless the new National Football League. Football is back. I'm going to take down the go. They're going to take the division. And so is this football cartoon. This football code too, and we're gonna give that voice a little time here to give a classic <laughs> Lefko opinion or take. So get that movie preview voice going, and I'm gonna pitch some NFL moments here. You've got your microphone, you monster. Okay, first up is the epic Gabe, not Gabriel, Gabe Davis touchdown. Go. From the shadow of their own goalpost, Josh Allen emerged not only with a 98-yard touchdown, <laughs> but with a declaration. I am him, coming January to a theater near you. <laughs> it's really well done. I love it. All right, let's do another one. Uh, I don't know, Philly guy, you want to do the Wentz interception? Is that what I'm hearing in my you ear? You bet I do, Kay. Come on. What do we got? With hope just yards away, Washington forgot Carson Wentz is colorblind. The roaring comedy coming, going commando, <laughs> coming straight to Quippy this winter. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I, don't know you can, <laughs> I don't know that you can now do it with this next one, but what do you got? Woo, I'm ready. Oh, Philly! A timeless classic, winner of nine Academy Awards, including best backup in a starting role. Nick Full stars as BDN in Philly Philly. New York City taxi <laughs> movie critic Sandy Kenyon calls it the greatest thriller to happen in Minnesota since Fargo. Now available at Redbox. <laughs> I'm standing. I'm standing. Sandy. Sandy Kenyon. Yeah, Jared getting, Allen and Sean Alexander. <laughs> Sandy Kenyon getting love on the show is my favorite thing that's happened. <laughs> if you've been in a taxi, you've seen that dude's hair. It is immaculate. It's, it's amazing, and his voice and his delivery, the second only to you, my friend. All right, we have I to go. I give it three popcorns. <laughs> okay. Sorry. 
you have uh, some, we have to have you back, I'm sorry, because you've got some really interesting bets on the NBA season, which of course opens up in a, what, uh, October 18th, the first night of NBA action. We can catch you Do every Tuesday night. Do I have 10 Tuesday seconds night. to give you a juicy yes, one? 10 of seconds? Yes, sure. I'm looking at the media guide. You know what Greg Popovich's record is? He's coached 25 season openers. Go ahead. He's 23 and two in season openers. They're taking on Charlotte. They just lost the mellow ball and they're plus two. Greg Popovich is 23 and two, Kay. <laughs> And now I'm done. It was great I, seeing and you. And now you're done. It's great. Hey, kiddo, it's great seeing you. Uh, if Victory Monday happens, you might have to have. You might have to hop on. You might have to. We'll t we'll talk. I'm down. You're shout out best. to your amazing producer. Thank you. Yes. Shout out to Marissa McBride, our Eagles producer. That was really nice of you, Adam. You're the best. And uh, yeah, we're screwed because we have two more commercial breaks to fit in the next ten minutes. GMC is teaming up with FanDuel for a free to play GMC Sierra Mountain Climber pick. Um, wow, that's a mouthful, but this car is amazing. All you got to do is log on to FanDuel.com before kickoff on Sunday early games. Answer some questions about the Sunday afternoon NFL matchups. And the more answers you get right, the higher you move up the mountain. Fans who get every answer right reach the summit and win a share of some money. All right, you're looking to look at some waiver wire ads. Here you go. Pick them up. Get them in your lineup. Kenneth Walker, Rashad Perry's done, uh, Penny's done for the year. Deion Jackson, Jonathan Taylor might be back. Still worth scooping him up. Alec Pierce. This kid's available in 90% of leagues. He's clearly the second guy to Michael Pittman. Get him and a that tight end. Taysom Hill, somehow still available everywhere. I mean, you can't expect the three scores and 100 yards every week, but you can certainly uh, understand that with Michael Thomas and Olave injuries, you should get him involved. And Carson Wentz, listen, he might not be Ron Rivera's cup of tea, but I think for fantasy, he's perfect, and he's uh, actually got high finishes in five weeks. Back on Up and Adams, uh, we've got some underreactions. I gave you mine. We're not talking about Nick Chubb nearly enough. I'll get to Matt Judon tomorrow. He deserves some love, but Sunday Gravy saying Pat's D. No one is talking about how great they're doing. I am. We see you, Judon. Keep dominating. And by the way, keep bringing personality to everything you do. And Jeff Nordy says Alec Pierce might be wide receiver one. That's why he's on the waivers list, people. It all makes sense. For my double mint t-shirt to you, have a good day.